question. When was the last time someone shushed you? You ever had someone whisper, don't say that? Or maybe you just got the look. You know, the furrowed eyebrows, often male, that seem to say, why are you talking? Well, I want you to know something. In my life, I got shushed a lot, a lot, because I'm a talker. And very early on in my life, I learned that my voice could get me into trouble. I mean, from the beginning, when I'd scream for help from toddler skirmishes with my brothers, and I'd feel my dad's hand on my head. Years later, I said, how come I was the one who always got hit? And he said, you know, your mom and I just swatted at the most annoying voice. Years later, not too many years later, I found my desk outside in the hall of the kindergarten classroom, all for the crime of sharing some very important news. It was around that time I realized I had to keep my voice in check. I had to say less, and I had to be nice. That's what good girls do. In the eighth grade, I learned that the pitch and volume of my voice weren't the only problem. My voice was particularly dangerous when it was coupled with an opinion or the word no. That's how I ended up in Principal Forche's office at St. Thomas School. It was a hot, sweltering day, like 85 degrees, solid humidity. The school had no air conditioning, so I had rolled up the sleeves of my long sleeve denim shirt and undid the few buttons at the bottom and tied it in a knot. You know how we do that? To reveal one inch of gasp, skinny white abdomen. Well, Mrs. Miraguay, the eighth grade teacher, took one look of that in front of everybody, said, untie that knot. And you know, on that day, I was just too hot to be a good girl. And I said, no. Well, first of all, I thought that woman's head was gonna spin off, but instead, she sent me to Principal Forche, who decided to educate me on the sexual arousal triggers for eighth grade boys. To which I said to him, sir, I was a polite 14 year old, sir, are you saying it's my job to control a boy's erection? I was sent home. <laughs> well, even though I knew my voice could get me into trouble, I also had this undying desire to use my voice. Remember I told you I'm a talker. I make a new best friend every time I get on an airplane. Who's on my flight tomorrow? And so I sought careers where I could be a communicator. Writing, teaching, talk radio, television news. By the time I got to television news, the place where I thought my voice would be most empowered, I found my voice was still being shaped and directed by men. First of all, most of the words I spoke were actually written by men. Two men, an agent and a news director, sent me to two different male voice coaches. Both coaches had the directive to lower my voice. Apparently, a woman cannot read the news in America unless we speak like a man. So by the time I graduated from television news and was doing talk radio and teaching, I had the voice game down. I knew all the rules. Be nice, be sweet, be agreeable. Be nice, be sweet, be agreeable, don't say too much. And above all, never be a whiner or complainer. I was a pro. I'd been shushed, and that's how I learned. So it's kind of ironic that my hesitation to speak out about sexual harassment turned out to be my hidden superpower. In the fall of 2016, I was walking across campus to my car at Cal State Channel Islands where I teach psychology, doing what we do, shortcut across the grass, tiptoeing in high heels, swiping through my phone, reading, and I stopped at an email that was kind of interesting. Dear Wendy, my name is Emily Steele. I'm a reporter with the New York Times. I'm doing an investigation into sexual harassment at Fox News. I think you're in a position to help. Please call me. Now, I didn't think for a minute that this woman wanted to hear a female truthful voice. She wanted to hear my well-edited and curated voice. She wanted a quote from a media psychologist on the mental health ramifications to victims of sexual harassment. So I picked up the phone. What I heard at the other end shocked me. A high, sweet, angelic, feminine voice. Didn't she know? 
But then the words she spoke shocked me even more. She said, listen, I've been going through old episodes of The O'Reilly Factor, and I see that you used to appear as a regular guest, and then you suddenly disappeared. Can I ask why? Well, in fact, I hadn't been on the show in three years, and here's why. In January of 2013, I was invited as an unpaid guest, and I appeared on three occasions, kind of an audition. And then I got a really exciting email from an employee at Fox News who said that Mr. O'Reilly, the big boss of the show, was coming to Los Angeles, where I live, and would I have dinner with him? Well, I was so excited. This would be my opportunity to talk to him about being brought on as a paid contributor. And in fact, the good news is this. We sat down to dinner, and I didn't even have to bring it up, because in the first five minutes, he said, Roger Ailes, the then chairman of Fox News, uh, is a friend of his, and Roger and he would like to offer me a job as a paid contributor. I was so excited. The rest of the dinner, we talked about things that adults talk about at dinner. How many kids you have, how old are they, how long you've been at Fox, blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the dinner, everything changed. He simply said the words, let's get out of here. I assumed he meant, let's continue to talk about my career at Fox News in the bar. So as we sailed past the hostess stand at the Wolfgang Puck restaurant at the Bel Air Hotel, I turned left towards the bar, and he turned right towards what I now know are the bedrooms. So it was weird. We were walking away from each other a bit, and then we turned, and then he caught up with me, and I did a little, I think the bar is this way. And, uh, he said the words that made my heart sink. He said, no, come back to my suite. Be nice, be sweet, be agreeable. Be nice, be sweet, be agreeable. Don't be a whiner, don't be a complainer. I thought fast, and I did what most women would do in that situation. I apologized. Apparently, I'm responsible for Bill O'Reilly's erection, too. So <laughs> I said, I'm sorry, Bill, I can't do that. And then I thought fast, and I said, come on. We're both raising teenage daughters. Don't you think we should model some good choices for them? He wasn't happy to hear about his teenage daughter at that moment. So we went to the bar. He wasn't happy to be there. I ordered a soda water. He complained about the cost of water at fine hotels. Be nice, be, nice, be sweet, be agreeable. Be nice, be sweet, be agreeable. So I picked up my purse, and I said, oh, I'll be happy to pay for this round from a man who makes $20 million a year. I was ready to buy my glass of water. He took one look at my purse, and maybe it had become a metaphor for how he was feeling about me, because he said, that's the ugliest bag I've ever seen. Be nice, be sweet, be agreeable. Be nice, be sweet, be agreeable. I finished my water, was polite, got in my Uber. Make no mistake, I did everything to try to save that job offer. He had mentioned he was researching a new book, so I sent him an email with book suggestions for research. I wrote to his executive assistant. I said, please tell Mr. O'Reilly how grateful I am that he's so supportive of my career. Radio silence. The last time I saw him, I happened to be in New York, and a segment producer emailed me and said, hey, you're in New York. Why don't you come on the set and do a segment with Bill O'Reilly? I had not seen or spoken to that man since that awful night, and now I had to sit four feet away from him on a set. He pretty much just looked at his scripts and iced me out. And somehow I felt embarrassed. I felt ashamed, as if I had done something wrong. Soon after, I received a telephone call from the executive producer of the show telling me I would not be welcome back. So, Back to that Angel's Voice New York Times reporter. Turns out she's a fearless feminist. She won the Pulitzer Prize for this article. I told her this story. I told her everything that I just told you, but I told her one other thing. I would not be going on record, thank you very much. I knew when to use my voice and when not to. I told her I was afraid, and I had very good reason to be afraid. First of all, the potential for public backlash from the media or online trolls. And there is research to show that public humiliation hits the brain the same way as a physical pain. But there was another reason that I was afraid. I know too well the history of women who dare to speak out. They are deemed liars, lunatics, hysterical, or even witches. At best, 
they are dismissed. At worst, they are locked up or burned at the stake. Nope, I'm not going to do it. I also knew the attitudes of many men when it comes to sexual harassment and sexual assault. That fearless feminist would not take no for an answer. That girl got her butt on an airplane, flew out to LA, checked into a hotel across the street from a Pilates studio where she knows I like to work out, and on the mega former beside me, she said, you have to meet me for coffee. I have to tell you about the other victims. Other victims? Turns out, there had been potentially dozens of women at Fox News who had been brave, who had spoken out, who dared to complain. And each time, they had been removed from their jobs, becoming ostensibly unemployable because now they were difficult women, and facing an uncertain financial future, they were forced to take a settlement in exchange for selling their voice. They signed non-disclosure agreements and were silenced for life. Emily Steele at the New York Times gave me a steely stare and said, you're the only voice left. You're the only one who can talk on behalf of those victims. Me, my voice, the one I'd been so careful with. I'd curated it, edited it. I'd been a good girl. I didn't whine, I didn't complain. That's what you do, right? Before I made the agonizing decision to go on record, I thought I would interview literally every single woman I knew. And I noticed a very disturbing generational divide. If a woman was over 40, guaranteed she'd say, don't do it, you'll be blackballed. But young women, my college-aged daughter and her friends, they thought it preposterous that I should not speak out. And I thought to myself, if these bright, loud young women can be unafraid, then a full-grown, full-blown, big mouth like me should be able to. And so, with history and patriarchy stacked against me, I went on record. All right, I won't lie to you. Those online trolls, they are really, really nasty. They say awful, violent things. I mean, a chainsaw up the vagina, anyone? Whew. One of them even posted the addresses of my children's schools online. That rattled me a little bit. But let me tell you this. Once you walk through the fire, you become more self-confident and more powerful than ever. Who could have imagined that four years after that fateful dinner, an international media firestorm would erupt? Online activists would give birth to a with Wendy hashtag. Protesters would show up with signs marching at Fox News headquarters. And advertisers? Thank you, Mercedes-Benz, for being the brave first. Advertisers pulled out in droves. Within two weeks, the career of arguably the most powerful man in cable news would end. Now, I don't feel glee over this, but what Fox did next, I'm really happy about. They cleaned house all over the company and they became a role model for companies all over the world who started listening to women and started changing their protocol in how they deal with women. You know, my story is just a tiny ripple that helped give birth to the Me Too movement. And I know there's a version of my story inside every one of you. Okay, your voice can get you into trouble, but your voice is also your power. And do you know why all those people shushed you? Because they were afraid of your power. I believe that your voice is also your responsibility. Now, using your voice doesn't mean you have to stand with a bullhorn on a street corner. It doesn't mean you have to appear on the front page of the Sunday New York Times. 
It may simply mean looking at the world around you. And when you see injustices, speaking up. What if I told you that your voice is the only way to free yourself and the only way to save anyone else? And maybe, just maybe, the only way to change history. Would you speak up then? Thank you. Thank you.